Hello everyone. Welcome to Hashimoto's Awareness Monthly Conference Call. My name is Fabian Hemans. I am the co-founder with Pearl Thomas of Hashimoto's Awareness Nonprofit Organization. And we also have Joseph Campos tonight, one of our directors. And Hello everyone. Hello Joe. Hi. As most of you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common autoimmune disorder. Tonight, we will open a conversation with James Maskell about functional medicine, a crucial topic for us with autoimmune disorder. We will have a lecture about 35 minutes, and then we will open the line to you, to the audience, for question and answer, and Joseph will let you know um, the logistic on how to do this at that time. And we'll tell you a few words about James right now. Jim Maskell has spent the past decade sparking the debate and encouraging a shift away from conventional Western medicine and towards a wellness-centered functional medicine model, starting with the doctors themselves. To that end, he created Functional Forum, the world's large integrative medicine conference with record-setting participation online and growing physician communities around the world. He's also the founder and the CEO of Evolution of Medicine, a community which provides highly customized resources, tools, products, and services, making it easier and more affordable for a conventional doctor to embark on a new way of managing healthcare. And James lectures internationally and has been featured on Ted Show, Huffington Post, The Doctor's Blog, and many, many more. He serves on the faculty of George Washington University a metabolic medicine institute and he graduated with honors from University of Nottingham with a degree in health economics and he lives in Venice Beach California with his wife and daughter we are delighted to have you with us tonight James thank you great to be here with you all thanks Fabienne oh, absolutely pleasure and we're going to open a very important uh, conversation with you tonight about functional medicine and why it's so relevant for Hashimoto's community. Would you like to say a few words about why it is relevant to Hashimoto's? Absolutely. Well, you know, it's very interesting. If you look around the functional medicine world, you see a lot of practitioners um, who are doing great work who have recovered themselves from Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is the most common autoimmune disease, uh, but it also is something that you know many people now have had a lot of success with reversing or uh, being able to you know get into a position where they don't have the symptoms of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But I think you know what, what's really exciting is that so many people have had this issue, being able to reverse it, and now being able to communicate um, how they did it. And you know the, the reason why functional medicine I think is so relevant to the Hashimoto's conversation is because it, it perfectly Hashimoto's to me is the perfect example of of where the value proposition for functional medicine goes above Western medicine. So for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with functional medicine, there's a coin uh, term coined by Dr. Jeffrey Bland in about the year 2000 to talk about the, the body of work that he'd been doing as a nutritional biochemist and um, the group that he'd been collating for about, uh, you know, about two decades. But functional medicine uh, is uh, basically an operating system of medicine that's very different from conventional medicine. Some of the goals of functional medicine are, you know, things that it's associated with are root cause resolution of symptoms. So not just looking at symptoms, but looking at the root causes. It's also associated with building the function of different organs and systems. It takes a systems biology look at the body, so it, it sees that all of the organs and systems in the body are connected, and the body needs to be thought of in a sort of a, in a connected way. And so it's a lot more of a, an effective way of, of looking at some of these complex autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's. Now, um, you know, the, the functional medicine uh, bandwagon has recently received a lot more traction by the fact that a major medical institution in the Cleveland Clinic is starting to bet on functional medicine for the future of chronic disease management. They started out with a very small center inside the Cleveland Clinic, and now because of the success of the center and the demand for the services, 
Um, they've grown, and now it's going to be a major center within the Cleveland Clinic. And the CEO of Cleveland Clinic, Toby Cosgrove, has said that he's really betting on functional medicine uh, for the um, you know for the future of chronic disease management. And so uh, I think it's an exciting time to be in medicine. Obviously, if you have Hashimoto's, um, this hopefully is a very empowering message. I think, and, and, I'm, and there's a lot more people on the line that have had Hashimoto's than, than, than myself, but what I've heard from other practitioners and doctors who I'm friends with who have recovered from Hashimoto's thyroiditis is they say, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's nice to have an empowering structure to believe in it because typically with autoimmune disease, if you go and see a regular Western doctor, you know, an autoimmune disease is an incurable thing. There's nothing you can do about it. You just have to take these drugs in this order, and you'll try and manage it for the rest of your life, whereas there are so many examples now of doctors and other providers that have overcome their own Hashimoto's thyroiditis and have actually used that to catapult their career to be able to see, you know, see medicine very differently. And one example that I will just give you, and I'll give her a plug just because she's a good friend of mine, she recovered from Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and she has a new book coming out this week. Dr. Kelly Brogan, her book is called The Mind of Your Own. It comes out on Tuesday the 15th. And her whole medical history and her whole departure from conventional psychiatry to now holistic psychiatry came because of her own diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And her going into the literature, going in to see what is the root cause of these kinds of diseases, led her on a journey that now she... Um, not only would treat someone with Hashimoto's very differently, but would treat people with a range of psychiatric conditions very differently. And that's one of the most exciting things with functional medicine is that there's probably not going to be a diet that's good for Hashimoto's, and it's not going to be that different from a diet that's good for diabetes or diet for heart. You know, there are certain principles that are you know, going, to be, are going to be congruent all the way along. And um, that's why I'm excited to, to share with you guys all about what we're doing uh, to be able to build the ecosystem of functional medicine so that not only can we make it available to every person in America, but also that we can make it affordable because the big elephant in the room right now for functional medicine is that it's not that affordable for most people. Now, the majority of the work that you would do to recover yourself from, from Hashimoto's thyroiditis is something that you would do yourself. That's another part of functional medicine is that it's participatory. It requires the participation of the patient in the process. It's not something that gets done to you. It's something that you're a participant in. But I have to say from everything that I've seen, um, you know, if you can uh, find a functional medicine doctor and you can realize your role in the healing process and you can work with that functional doctor, um, to work through it, then the reversal of, of Hashimoto is not only possible, but there's a, you know, a proven pathway of many people um, getting back to full health after a diagnosis. Yes, and we need more functional doctors around, especially in New York City. Absolutely, we, we, yeah. Every, every day we, we get emails. Um, so thank you for doing the work you're doing and for being who you are in the world. We, thank you, yeah. We, Mm -hmm. What is happening right now in the functional medicine? Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, you know, you have the, the Cleveland Clinic, which is doubling down on functional medicine, building a bigger center, and that's really, I think, a signal to the rest of medicine that this is real. You know, I think a lot of the principles involved in functional medicine have been previously considered maybe quote-unquote quote alternative medicine, um, but what you're starting to see is that you know, it's not alternative anymore to want to engage patients into the process. It's not alternative anymore to take a systems biology approach. And it's not alternative, um, you know, to be able to try and uh, prevent and reverse disease. You know, there's a lot going on. Another friend of mine, Dr. Rongan Chatterjee, who's a doctor in the UK, functional medicine doctor, just finished a, a TV series uh, at the end of last year called Doctor in the House, where he actually went in and, um, you know, he'd spend a, a month with people, sort of like Dr. Oz meets Super Nanny, and he'd go into your house and he'd, you know, spend a month with you. And uh, in that show, he reversed type 2 diabetes twice in 30 days. He reversed eczema, chronic pain, um, you know, range of diseases through this functional medicine paradigm. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's, 
obviously there's like all of these books coming out. Mark Hyman is probably the best known person in this field, and he's got another best selling book out. Um, so, you know, there's the demand for functional medicine is growing and growing. What my job has been to do is recognize that, okay, yes, the demand is growing. We need to build the supply because, you know, at the moment what you're seeing is that there's way too much demand and not enough supply of these doctors. And it's because, frankly, you know, as I said earlier, it's been maligned as sort of alternative medicine for that long and doctors have been educated to be skeptical to these sort of kind of these kind of ideas but now these ideas are arriving in the mainstream it's been hard to get doctors unblocked and the only doctors that have made their way across or the majority of doctors that have made their way across to doing functional medicine are ones that had their own diagnosis that they couldn't get better with functional with regular medicine and so look for alternatives and ended up in functional medicine and end up practicing that um, but because it's not reimbursed by insurance typically and because it's a different kind of model, you're spending a lot more time with patients and time isn't something that's typically well reimbursed within the current medical model, um, it's been tricky for doctors to work out how to build a business or how to build a practice doing functional medicine. But what I would tell you right now and what is happening is that the ecosystem of functional medicine is starting to grow. And, um, and starting to expand. And so what we've been doing uh, at the Evolution of Medicine, which is my company, is really trying to make it easy for doctors to start to practice functional medicine and sort of reduce the barriers to entry. So um, for those of you who are interested, you know, we have a show called the Functional Forum, which is our, sort of the main thing that we do. Um, it's been, we've made 24 episodes. It's a 90-minute show um, that runs on the first Monday of every month. It's completely free to watch, and if you go to youtube.com slash functional forum, you can watch all 24 back episodes on there. We featured some of the leading stars of, uh, of functional medicine. And there's one particular video that I'd like to you know, let you know about because it has a particular reference to Hashimoto's, and I know that you were there when it actually happened, Fabienne. You were there right. in last November. Um, mm -hmm. The, the, the uh, event was called The Hormone Symphony, and if you go onto our YouTube channel, you can see it. But Dr. Vincent Pedre, who's a New York functional medicine doctor, essentially you know, gave the scientific validation or the scientific structure and the practical structure of how to treat Hashimoto's in a functional medicine structure. And you know, what I want to do just briefly is, first of all, you can go and watch that. So if you go to youtube.com slash functional forum, it's about 40 minutes long, and you can watch that. There's some pretty dense science in there because this show is designed for doctors. But I also think that um, for most of you who really want to get into this and are passionate now about understanding yourself and understanding your body, it might be um, a good thing to know because he talks a lot about it. But the new paradigm of Hashimoto's and, and autoimmune disease goes something like this. You know, in the, in the past, the old paradigm is that this is just something that happens and then you just got to try and, you know, um, cover the symptoms with, with drugs or you may take, a, you know, uh, an immune suppressant drug uh, or Humira or something like that. You know, the problem is if you go down that route, there's no real end in sight. There's no time. There's no plan to get off those drugs. And those drugs have very debilitating um, uh, issues, side effects on the rest of the body. Even further than that, I would say is that I've heard some research recently that if you have an autoimmune disease and you just start taking drugs for it and you don't look at root cause, you don't do any lifestyle modification, you can actually end up with on average five autoimmune diseases within a few years because you're not dealing with the root of the problem. So the way that the, the basic triad that the functional medicine teaches about autoimmune disease is this. And this is not something that they came up with. This is based on the work of Dr. Alejandro Fasano, um, Alessio Fasano, sorry, in Harvard. And he sort of breaks it down like this. So, First of all, it, the two triggers that would it would be is one is, is environmental triggers. So that could be you know that could be food, that could be chemicals, that could be things within a home environment. Um, it could be uh, pollutants. It could be you know um, chronic stresses, some sort of environmental triggers. Um, and then um, you know the the sort of another key catalyst is this new uh, is a concept called leaky gut. 
Now, leaky gut is actually a perfect example of why this medicine hasn't made it into the mainstream because leaky gut from the time that um, it was coined, that phrase was coined, has always been maligned as part of alternative medicine. It wasn't real, and doctors have been trained for years and years to say, no, that it does not exist, leaky gut is not real. Well, now there's science to back it up, and it's, pretty much, it's in the mainstream scientific literature that not only leaky gut does it exist, but it contributes to, um, you know, to autoimmune disease. So those are the two things that are within your control in, an auto, in this paradigm, the, you know, the environmental insults and then the, uh, the leaky gut. And then the third part of the, the triangle is your genetics. And essentially, you, know, you could have the same environmental insults and the same leaky gut in two different people, and it would end up manifesting in one person as Hashimoto's, and it would end up um, manifesting in another person as one of the other autoimmune diseases like Crohn's or colitis or um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and those are typically some of the other diseases that people get when they start going down this path. So, you know, so the, the empowering message for functional medicine is that two out of those three things you can change. You can't change your genetics, but you can change how your genes express themselves. And the two ways that you can do that is by changing the environment in which your genes bathe themselves. And, um, you know, uh, there's actually, we just had a talk in this last functional forum about genetics and genomics and basically how, uh, you know, human genes are, are definitely... Um, uh, 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 the genes are expressed through the junk DNA and there's a lot more control through uh, diet, life, lifestyle, exercise and community and love and all those other things that go into gene expression. Um, and so, you know, that's an empowering message for people is that you can control, the, you can start to control the environment and change the environmental triggers. And then if you have a leaky gut, there are things that you can do to repair that leaky gut. And that's what a functional medicine doctor would, would help you to do. Or there's all kinds of information on the internet about this now, and you can start to implement it yourself. But the truth is, you know, we're, we're in a position where um, there are you know, tens of thousands of people who have recovered from these kind of diseases by taking these kind of approaches. So to sum up for your question, Fabienne, what's happening is that, you know, this is getting some, you know, mainstream legitimacy. Um, more and more patients are finding it. And on the other side to that, um, you know, the ecosystem of functional medicine is being delivered. So what are we doing in this? We've started the functional forum and now we have uh, over two, it's the first Monday of every month, we now have over 200 meetup groups of doctors around the world getting together to watch the functional forum and 10 of those meetup groups, or maybe even a dozen by now, have more than 100 doctors attending. So what we're trying to do is to reduce the barriers to entry to be able to help doctors to find out about functional medicine so that they can get interested, so that they can get trained, and so they can help people with these kind of diseases. So our goal in our business right now is all about making it easy for doctors to practice functional medicine. And, um, you know, we're doing that through, you know, educating them clinically, teaching them about new practice models that can make this affordable for people and can have a, you know, good, a good system for that and then also technology that can help to empower the relationship between the patient and the provider so that we can reduce the costs overall, make it more affordable, make it more efficient. Wonderful. It's great to hear that. I mean, I remember 35 years ago, I was signing petition in the health food store because they were talking about closing all of them in the state. So we came a long, long way, and um, it's certainly a, a subject of passion for me. Uh, it feels like lifetime, so it's uh, wonderful to hear what's happening. And I, we are at HE, 100% behind you guys. In uh, talking about HA, uh, we are really this is why we have the, the support groups is for you know creating a community. And in your last tech talk, you talk a lot about community and the role of communities that it plays in hell. Could you say a few words about that? Absolutely, yeah, so a few things. So first and foremost, um, community is now emerging as a serious factor in health. So that we had this guy on uh, our show recently called Dr. George Slavich, 
and it's from the UCLA Stress Lab. Now, I may have understressed earlier how important stress is as an environmental factor in you know, the way that genes express themselves. And I would say to everyone that social stress or stress generally is, is a massive driver. And obviously for all the people who are in New York, they probably know that. But um, that's part of the reason why I left New York last year to move to California because I realized exactly, you know, because I read the literature and saw what was going on. Not the only reason, but one of the reasons. Anyway, um, so, you know, so, and, and so there's a big area of stress that has not been seen very often, you know, has not been, um, has been sort of underestimated, and that's social stress. And what they're finding now is that social isolation, lo loneliness, uh, lack of community, a lack of real relationships is a real primary driver of um, gene expression. So, you know, and, and in some cases what they're seeing with UCLA Stress Lab is that it's a bigger driver of, uh, of um, negative health, like all-cause mortality and also, um, you know, a chronic disease than diet or exercise or nutrition. So it's, it's so important. It's, it could be the most important. And so there's a real, you know, there's a real onus on the development of community, and that's why I wanted to come on this show and with you guys to talk about it, because what you guys are doing with the Hashimoto's um, organization is creating community, creating a community of like-minded people. Now, what I did with the Functional Forum was to be able to initially create one community, which was the New York Functional Medicine Doctor community, and so that's how it started. But then once we started streaming the show, we encouraged people to start communities around that content, and now we have these 200 communities around the country that are really starting to grow, and there's community. Now, that's community for physicians and practitioners, but community for patients is, you know, and for the regular person who has Hashimoto's is just as important. So my recommendation is this. Now, I don't know what you guys are doing with community, but my recommendation is to use online tools to create offline community. You know, you can find easily, you know, there's a lot of value from online communities. You can see things like patients like me or otherwise, you know, where you're putting patients with similar kind of conditions together. That can be really helpful because, you know, when you put people in a community together, there's a peer-to-peer -peer support that is valuable for everyone. You know, if, if you, you know, Fabienne, you had Hashimoto's, now you have this institute. You know, when you teach other people about how they can sort of reverse their Hashimoto's, you know, they're getting value from it that they're not having to pay for. You're getting value from it that you're not having to pay for. And so, you know, as the teacher, and so there's value to everyone. And so what we, what we see is that there's real value created in this peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, community support. So what I typically like to, you know, to, um, you know, to, to do is to talk about the, the power of community. So if you're, if you're listening to this and you don't have a community of people, you know, one of the best things that you can do is develop a community around a healthy habit. So getting together with people and having relationships is good, but if you can do it and you can get together and base your connections and community around another healthy habit, then you get like a synergistic effect where it's healthy to do, say, a walking club or it's healthy to be in a CSA community supported agriculture where you're in a group of other, you know, other people who care about health and you're getting your vegetables together. Um, you know, there's so many different ways that you can connect with people, but we've seen, yeah, war running clubs, walking clubs, different kinds of organizations where we make it easy, you know, we've got to try and make it as easy as possible for people to get together and share. And so that's really, you know, what I would recommend is, is to realize that community is a, is a huge part of, um, of your health. The healthiest places in the world, like the Blue Zones, if you haven't read Dan Buettner's book on the Blue Zones, it's really fascinating. He looked at the places in the world where people live to 100 consistently without, the, without 100, without um, the same level of chronic disease, and they eat different things in those different places, and they, you know, exercise differently, and they have different types of um, environmental uh, toxins or otherwise, but the one thing they all have in common is they all have a strong sense of community. You know, we're tribal creatures. We were, we've been, this is thousands of years of, of evolution or millions of years of evolution uh, for us to, you know, to us to, to operate in a certain way. And so that's a, that's a huge part. So I, I really encourage, you know, the, the development of this community, the support of this community, and essentially being able to 
continue to create communities wherever you go. And so not only do we create, not only have we created these communities of practitioners, but we also train practitioners on how to create a community around their health practice because we believe that functional medicine practices are the most important place or the most logical place to build healthy communities around. That's fabulous. Um, yeah, we totally believe in community. Actually, on our website, there is a page, an entire page, um, that uh, that talks about community and how to create it. So I invite you to take a look at it. Um, and we also train um, people around uh, the states to open their own um, HA group so that in your own area you can be a leader. And we will help you to do that as well. We have two groups actually starting today. So that's exciting. And thank you for the inspiration because, yes, I would love to. Um, we have to brainstorm about that, um, Joe, about a running, a running club. or It's a great idea. Yeah. Um, how, can, um, how can our community play the greatest role in impacting medicine? So look, I mean, you're going to develop a community of, of some people, uh, you know, one way, and I think you could definitely develop this, this Hashimoto's community, and I think it would be valuable. But look, we need help developing. I, I, I suspect that the people who are, in this, who are listening to this call who have Hashimoto's basically, you know, are, are some way part through their recovery and, you know, either have it now and are struggling with it or are now starting to learn about new options and are maybe changing their diet and, you know, looking at some, some ways that they can play a role in reversing their disease. And so, you know, the key thing that you have to see is that what I see is that people who go through that process probably want to do a job that reflects their new understanding. They don't want to just have a job that they hate anymore. They really realize that it's important for them to, you know, to have a, you know, to, um, you know, to, to have their work aligned with their passion, right? And this is a, a growing trend, not just in Hashimoto's, but all across the world. Millennials are super into it, and more and more people are realizing that, you know, you can, you, you, it's, it's fun and life is better when you have your life work associated with your passion, and you're not just like having a day job and then, you know, trying to do fun stuff on the weekend. That's kind of why I quit being an investment banker one year into it, uh, you know, 11 years ago, because I realized I wanted to do one thing and have my life be one congruent thing and not, um, you know, not two different jobs. And so I would just encourage anyone, if you're listening, one of the things that you could do if you wanted to start something on the side, if you have a job, is to start a functional forum meetup. I mean, literally, you may think you don't know enough about it to get going. I have no medical training. I have never been any type of practitioner. All I did was immerse myself into this world for, you know, for this long that now I knew, I basically ended up knowing more about how to run a practice than, you know, than a lot of the doctors. And so I, you know, developed some ability, but it took a number of years. And I would say to anyone, you know, if you were to actually be able to build a meetup and, and, you know, get functional doctors to come to the meetup and do it anywhere you are in the country, you know, in New York, we have a meetup in New York, but like there's, we need one in, you know, in, in Harlem, <laughs> you know, we need one in the Bronx, in Queens, in Brooklyn, in Jersey, you know, in, uh, in Westchester, like, you know, the, the, we want to build this ecosystem and there's an opportunity for anyone right now for free to start to build these meetups. So one, you're going to meet all these functional doctors, right? You're going to meet all these people. Two, you're going to be a valuable asset. You know, one of the things that we see is that if, if someone could prove themselves as a good community builder of these health professionals, there's a ton of people that would want to hire them. Um, people that sell stuff to functional doctors, um, you know, people who are, you know, like labs and supplement companies. So, you know, I would say that the first thing you want to do is, is get yourself well and focus on that because if you're not well, it's very hard to do anything else. There's the ancient proverb, right? The, uh, you know, the, the well have many goals, the sick only have one, and that's to get themselves well. So the first thing you need to do is that, but I would say that there are opportunities whether you want to be like a health coach and work with a doctor. That's one of the things that we're seeing is an emerging best practice is pairing doctors and health coaches together um, to be able to create a really good team and, and um, 
you know, one of the clinics. There's a few clinics in, in Manhattan that, um, that I could talk about if that's a good resource where they have doctors and coaches working together and, you know, are really delivering affordable uh, functional medicine. Uh, but then, you know, uh, but then, you know, I think at that point, uh, some people don't want to be clinicians. They want to be, you know, they, they don't want to be involved with helping other people get well. Well, you know, people, salespeople are always valuable. And if you can prove that you can bring together a community of practitioners, you're going to be very valuable to employers who are looking to, to access that kind of community. You know, I think one of my favorite quotes, you know, the quotes that I talk about is that, you know, initiatives can't be given. It can only be taken. And we have a structure right now where if you go to meetup.functionalforum.com, where you can set up your own meetup, you can set up a um, time to do that. We'll give you some structures and ideas on how to get people to come to your event. But essentially, you know, this is um, you know, this is something that you could do just like a couple of hours a month. Um, and if you're good at it and, and you make it work and you enjoy it and you meet these people and you like this community, you could end up having a you know a career in this uh, exciting, growing industry. And that's something that I would love to help more and more people to uh, to align their passion and their work. Beautiful. Yes, very inspiring. And um, we are at the point where we're going to open the line for questions to, for the audience. Um, just if you want to say a few uh, words about the logistics of that. Sure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put all the phones into Q&A mode. Uh, so bear, me, bear with me one second. And uh, then once it, uh, the phones are in Q&A mode, uh, everyone will have the opportunity to ask a question. So uh, while we're waiting for someone to raise their hand, uh, I have a question for you, James. Yep. How does one approach functional medicine after, for instance, seeing many uh, conventional doctors for so many years, how does one sort of bridge the gap? What's the first thing uh, we should do or look for, or, or how do we, how do we uh, set up for that? Yeah, well, I think, you need, I think the first thing is to sort of prepare yourself for what's to come. So like some of the education resources that I mentioned, there are tons of books on Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, you know, I think starting to read some of those books and get acquainted with some of the strategies. Um, there's a book that I like called Root Cause, which is by Dr. Isabella Wentz, the New York Times bestseller, all on Hashimoto's thyroiditis and how she recovered, takes it through exactly that process. There's a number of other books um, that are very much associated with, uh, you know, with um, this transformation. So the first thing I think is just to get comfortable with it, start to read the books, really start to get an idea of what other people have done, you know, to be able to do that. The next thing is I think you have to start to find a, a functional medicine physician because the, I think it's quite dangerous in an autoimmune types of condition, especially if you've got a serious situation, to just start trying to apply this by yourself. Um, you know, I think there's certain things that you can definitely apply. You can certainly change the diet. You can certainly start to exercise. You can make lifestyle modifications. But I think that, you know, there are certain things that you can do. For instance, if you know that you have leaky gut, you know, leaky gut, there are protocols online on how you can start to, um, start to do that. Um, but I would definitely recommend, you know, at least being in uh, connection with a functional doctor because there may be, you know, things that they would know to look out for. Um, and if you're going to switch from being on a conventional protocol of, of medication um, and you're moving towards doing a functional medicine protocol, I think you need a physician to overlook that when any drugs are involved because you can have drug, drug interactions. Um, you want to make sure that you're, you know, you're on a, uh, on a, uh, on a, on a sensible path. Um, so, you know, there's different ways to find that. This is a solution that we definitely want to solve in the, in, the, in the moment because it's not that easy. But if you go to functionalmedicine.org, they have lists of providers there. I would call around a few that, um, you know, that you could find in order to uh, find someone that you think is a fit. Not everyone on that website. That just means they've taken training in functional medicine, so it doesn't mean they're actually practicing it. And so, you know, it's very good for you to be able to spend the time and and um, go in and see who's actually doing functional medicine, make a few calls. I know some of you are in, in New York, and um, my doctor is Dr. Robin Burzin at parsleyhealth.com, P-A-R-S-L-E-Y health.com. And she is actually the perfect example 
of the kind of doctor that we're trying to inspire. You know, she's actually doing almost everything that we recommend. So, you know, she has a framework where it's not so expensive to see her. It's only $150 a month as opposed to some functional doctors where, you know, because you're paying for labs and stuff up front, you're paying for their time and you need a lot more time at the beginning because functional medicine, you will be heard and you'll be listened to. It can be, it can be a lot up front. So that, you know, 150 a month is comparable to, you know, gym membership in Manhattan. And so um, that's, that's one place that, you know, one place that I would, I would recommend. But yeah, exactly. She's doing it in, a, in the, exactly the way that we recommend, which is, you know, create a membership style practice so you know, you know who you're responsible for. She has health coaches and doctors working together. Her office is in a WeWork, in a co-working space. So it's private, but it's also low overhead. And so, you know, she can pass on the savings that she's making and not having a huge office to the patient. Um, and so that's, that's what we're really trying to help you know, uh, people to find and, and to help doctors to reproduce. So I just wanted to, to throw that in there. Well, thank you. Uh, once again, for the mm-hmm. callers on the phone, uh, mm-hmm. please dial star six to ask a question. I'm sorry, and Fabian. In the meantime, um, James, uh, the name of the doctor was Robin. What's the last name again? Berzin, B-E-R-Z-I-N. The company is at parsleyhealth.com. Um, okay. P-A-R-S-L-E-Y health.com and you can find out more there uh, but yeah she's my doctor I go and see her to 25th and Park and it's really uh, 23rd and Park and it's easy to, to get to for most places and uh, yeah she's, she's doing great work and she's you know she could be charging a lot more she came actually onto the functional forum a year and a half ago before she started this clinic where she was still working at another clinic and you know, said it out loud, which is the elephant in the room, was that she couldn't afford to see herself mm-hmm. working at this other clinic. And so she set out to create a clinic that really works um, for the average person, that they can afford it and that it's easy and fits in with their lifestyle and is technologically enabled, and she's doing it. And we're encouraging a lot more doctors to build that kind of practice. Right, that's wonderful. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions coming in? It looks like we don't have any questions right now. Okay. Um, we can continue talk, and if someone wants to have a question, just let us know. Then. Well, I, I too, was um, watching your, uh, uh, one of your TED Talks, and uh, you talked about the intersection of community and medicine, and I thought that was, um, uh, that was a, a new idea, sort of everything that you've been talking about tonight with meetup groups on the patient side and meetup groups on the physician side and then coming together, uh, I think that's really exciting news. And uh, it sounds very grassroots right now, but it sounds like it's making progress. And that's really inspiring. Yeah, it's, it's Thank you, fun, yeah, right? and I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as I said, the real value of this community is, is community is this peer-to-peer community support. And, um, you know, it's typically free. But if you think about it, if you, you know, you go back in time, Um, there was a lot more of this. And obviously, you know, one of the things that's happened in our modern culture is you'll become more separate. And I think that, uh, you know, part of the story that needs to be told in all industries, not just in medicine, is this movement from separateness to interbeing. And New Yorkers are maybe, you know, in some ways worse at it, in some ways better at it. You know, I was was in, um, in New York in Hurricane Sandy and just saw how amazing everyone came together um, in that situation, I think New Yorkers are, are very used to operating in each other's space and are considerate with each other there. But if you go, but at the same time, we're all very disconnected, you know, disconnected with technology, disconnected in our own little, um, you know, 500-square-foot uh, apartment. And so I think that, uh, you know, that, that it's a perfect opportunity to grow that. But you see community is becoming a buzzword. Brands are creating community. Organizations are creating community. And it's really because people want community. People thrive on community. And we've become so bereft of community that, you know, whoever creates it is going to get the attention and trust of people. And that could be a brand. It could be a group of people. It could be a nonprofit. But what there's the opportunity to be is for the people in your community just to, you know, to stand up and and start to, uh, you know, to uh, take this out to more people. Absolutely. And you can tell that it's working when you mention a book like Root Cause, um, which I know helped me a lot. And, um, you know, that just means to me that we're all talking about the same thing and we're all 
finding you know quality sources of information yeah absolutely well there's a lot there's a lot I think Hashimoto's is actually a great you know I think Hashimoto's could be like the disease category that breaks the camel's back because the value proposition of functional medicine versus regular medicine is so pronounced to me in, in Hashimoto's that I always sort of point at it as a disease condition and autoimmune disease generally and also type 2 diabetes as the types of conditions where you know, the value proposition of taking the functional medicine approach is so vastly more valuable than the other one in terms of, you know, healthcare outcomes. And I think once we see these outcome studies that are coming from the, uh, you know, from uh, uh, from uh, Cleveland Clinic, what we'll see is that for these kind of autoimmune diseases, the cost, you know, will be similar, but the value output will be the same as far as, like, if you're taking looking after people for five years, you know, looking at their health expenditures over five years, the value of a functional medicine approach will be will be undeniable, and that those kind of um, studies are going on right now. But if you want to get ahead of the studies, uh, then uh, I think you know there's there's the opportunity to still be a leader in your community by uh, by getting to these practitioners first. And you mentioned the Cleveland Clinic. What what do you think made or is making the Cleveland Clinic so successful? Well, they're doing it. I mean, they're the only major medical organization that's doing it. Um, you know, they, they committed to a small test, and it was very successful. You know, I think some of it is like the cult of personality of Mark Hyman, who's, you know, forced to be reckoned with. He is, you know, fit, strong guy. He's very uh, good at what he does. He's a great communicator, and he really understands this, this uh, concept, and he's got friends in high places. But I think more than anything, you know, the the thing I think that's most important with functional medicine and why they're doing it is it's participatory. It requires something from the patient. And so, you know, I think if we all take a step back, you know, Cleveland Clinic is best known for heart surgeries. That's what they do. And, you know, I think that they saw that they could continue to grow their income base by doing more and more heart surgeries and putting in more and more stents. But were people actually getting well? And was that actually creating health? And I think the biggest thing that you're seeing right now is a shift from disease management to health creation. And you don't, you don't manage disease and, and create health in the same way. In fact, it's completely opposite. And so functional medicine, I think, is, makes so much logical sense to people because if you can engage the patient to take control of their health and play a role in their health, then it's left it's less to do for the medical community. And there are certain things that medicine can't do. Medicine can't make up for 500 cheeseburgers. Like, there's just, there's no medicine for that. Um, so you have to, you know, you have to be able to engage the patient and the functional medicine paradigm really does engage the patient uh, in, in, a, in a proactive way because there are things that you can do to change your prognosis from your diagnosis. And that's, um, you know, that's the empowering message of functional medicine. And it looks like we have a, a question on the line, so I'm going to open up that line. Hold on one second. Uh, hello. Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your commitment and uh, your passion um, to us. So I really appreciate both of you for uh, this call. It's been extremely inspiring and enlivening. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, my question is... Uh, <clears throat> I've heard a lot of people talk about autoimmune as something that I need that, that people who are suffering with it need to learn to live with forever or maybe become functional again someday. Um, but what's inspired me about your talk is that I've heard you say that it's, it's possible to have a complete recovery um, and like a reversal. Uh, and that's very inspiring to me. Can you speak a little bit about that? Of what can you know we hope for as patients? Is there a range of recovery, or uh, depending on my you know disease, or uh, or can I really uh, you know expect or at least have hopes uh, for a complete and total recovery? Thank you. 
Yeah, look, obviously, you know, for the, thanks for the question, like the cream rises to the top. And so, like, I'm sure there's definitely a, a situation where those people have had the most incredible results, like their stories get being, you know, more widely shared, like Dr. Wentz or Dr. Kelly Brogan or Michelle Corey or, um, you know, other people in that world, Andrea Nakayama, all people who have written books about recovery from Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You know, I would say that, I, I I don't think I'm a complete expert uh, in this part of it. I'm not a doctor, and I don't know you know exactly. But I do know that a lot of these people that I know are, are very are completely asymptomatic, having been diagnosed and come back the other way. But um, you know, it doesn't mean that they don't have to you know keep their you know keep their um, you know keep their health in check. Most of those people that I just referred to to this day still live a very healthy lifestyle. So you know, obviously, if you're if if the if the things that affect your Hashimoto's include environmental triggers and leaky gut, and um, then you know, and those are the two things that you have control over, you're going to want to really take control over your environmental area ongoing. So that means you know you're going to want to make sure that there aren't environmental health risks that are affecting your gene expression. And so that would be like, okay, if you're super stressed in your job. You're probably going to have to learn how to meditate so that you know stress doesn't overcome. Because if you have too much stress over a certain amount of time, then you know then that might re-trigger you back towards the symptoms. So you know, or it might not be meditation, but it might be yoga, or it might be any sort of other practices that might be good for stress. Same thing with environmental toxicants. You know, um, if 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 uh, if it's extremely environmentally toxic. Uh, you know, if you have environmental toxins in the house, um, most common things to look at are just the, you know, the cleaners that you have in your house, like what you clean your house with. If you look at all the labels, um, you know, those can be particularly toxic, uh, but also, you know, toxic food. Like none of the people that I know that have recovered from autoimmune disease are, you know, are having fast food every day. Um, you know, one of the major causes of leaky gut one of the major identifiers is, is modern wheat. And we're not really sure whether that's because of the glyphosate that's you know, poured all over it, or whether it's the, um, you know, the genetic modification, or whether it's just the fact that American wheat has been bred to be a lot more glutinous. Um, but, but certainly, you know, I, I see a lot of those people that have recovered from autoimmune thyroiditis you know, are having to you know, have some dietary restrictions uh, ongoing, but I think there are definitely definitely plen plen enough examples of full recovery to inspire. If there is no more question, unless Jim has something to add or offer us, please feel free to take the space. Otherwise, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm glad to be here. It's been awesome being with, uh, with all of you here. Keep up the good work that you guys are doing. The perfect model of what we're recommending people to do: build community, provide support. You know, people who have gone through Hashimoto's, talking to other people about you know how to help it now. You know, that there's a there's an amazing amount. If you if you find a patient who has reversed their chronic you know disease, they always have a ton of information to give to other people. And if you can find a medium where that information can be delivered. Um, you know, for free, then it, it's valuable to everyone. So I applaud you guys for what you're doing with, with Hashimoto's Awareness and i um, glad to be here. And, and yes, yeah, if, uh, if people want to find out more about setting up a meetup group, they can go to meetup.functionalforum.com. Um, if, if you want to watch the um, episodes that we've had, you can go to youtube.com slash functionalforum and you can see all of our old episodes on there. Um, we've had uh, Isabella Wentz on the show. We've had Kelly Brogan on the show. We've had Andre Nakayama on the show. All three of those um, have recovered from Hashimoto's, and yeah. very, you know, other people that I know very well. I'm sure Fabian, you have a list of them. Yes, and many of the names that you uh, said tonight are actually on the board of Hashimoto's Awareness. So we are uh, keep close conversation with them, and always have the latest research. Um, you can uh, join our Facebook page, Hashimoto's Awareness Nonprofit Organization. We have a 100% response rate, actually. You can check that for yourself. Uh, don't take my word for it. It's about an hour, actually. Um, we are very active, and we will respond to you and support you in every way we can. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. And um, thank you so much, James, for the time. 
and your your um, resources. And I highly recommend you guys to check the forum online and to listen to these amazing um, people with the latest research. Um, I do myself and absolutely I love it and enjoy it, every one of them. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, thank you, uh, Fabian. I would just like to add that Hashimoto's Awareness is a nonprofit organization and we rely entirely on the donations of our supporters. So if you'd like to support our cause, please visit our website at HashimotosAwareness.org and click on the Donate Heart in the upper right-hand corner. Thank you, James. This has been very informative. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. <laughs>